First Spin. Welcome to First Spin, a show where I learn how to use a parallax propeller without having any prior programming experience. Rather than do this on my own, I have enlisted the help of two peoples. <laughs> Every single time I see my, my little prompt say experts, I just, I'm trained now. I'm Pavlovianly trained to avoid that word. I'm surprised you've made it this far without changing it. Well, <laughs> yeah, but it's that's because it's 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 uh, uh, what's the word? Have you been doing any uh, programming with your newfound uh, uh, knowledge? Um, I have, I have. So my latest uh, endeavor is XBs because we had we got them from Parallax, and I was like, oh. Well, this is cool. This will be a peripheral I could try on the prop BOE boards. And uh, so I've been working through the tutorial. At first, I, I wanted to avoid the tutorial because it was 160, uh, 163 pages long. And that's really intimidating to me. Mm. So. By the way, I'm Whisker and, and Roy's here too. Oh, right. Yeah. That's Whisker. Hi. That's Roy. <laughs> and, and we're the experts. <laughs> They're the experts. I'm the noob. <laughs> Started. We'll start programming where the other way now, Whisker. Yeah. <laughs> so. So XPs. Right, XPs. So I've been going through Could the tutorial. Could you explain and to uh, the listeners what, what on the world an XP is? An XP is uh, essentially like this wireless node that um, can transfer information from one node to another as if it had a cable in between it at 250 kilobits per second which is quite a bit, which is quite fast, actually. So wireless serial connection. Correct. And you can get that at Parallax? You can. Awesome. Yes. So yeah. it's it's been quite fun, actually. I mean, uh, I made a bit of a boo-boo yesterday because I was doing the code, and in the code, when you say that a pin, that when you when you are assigning a pin, you should also remember that that pin needs to be connected to the hardware in some form or fashion, i.e. via a wire. And so I hadn't had a, I didn't have a wire, any wires connecting the pins to the actual XB. And I thought it was the code that was messed up and I thought I was being brilliant, but. You just forgot to hook it up. I just forgot to hook it up. That's funny. <laughs> well, we, you can't blame us because we're not teaching you wiring. We're teaching you programming. That is true. The programming is going quite well, though. I'm being I'm able now to analyze basic spin code, so I am glad of that. Thank cool. you. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, is it super complicated, or is it actually kind of easy once you once you got the fundamentals? Mm, um. It's not completely intuitive, I don't think. I think if I sat down and... Because, right, okay, so the most complex thing that I've been able to do with this is make it talk to each other. So, like, uh, it acts like a chat client. Ah, uh, but... you're talking about the XBs. I was asking about spin in general. Oh, spin? I like spin. But But the thing is, what I've noticed is that when I look at a lot of people's code... It's all written very differently. And I guess that's the same with any programming language. But, I mean, people take, like, f I mean, just an innumerable uh, number of ways to, to get to the same place, right? Yeah. Well, some of that is because the programming languages allow for that. Right. Spin, spin especially so has lots of different ways of doing things. Right. That accomplish the end result is the same. Right. At the end. Right. And so that's the yeah. thing. That's it's difficult because you learn how to do something one way and then you look at something else and you realize it's doing the the very thing you've done this uh, in a completely different way. And so you have to kind of relearn each time. I don't know if that makes sense. It gets easier after you've seen a few variations. You start to learn what right. the patterns and stuff right but. now the thing is um so the there's a website for the propeller boe boards that are coming out and i looked through some of their examples for like blinking on and off leds 
mm-hmm. and they use uh, objects to blink on and off LEDs. And to me, that's more complicated than just actually putting the code in th- to blink the LED on and off. Well, some of that comes from the previous BOE, which is based around the basic stamp, mm. basic stamp two. Uh, they're trying to tie the two together a little bit by having the objects named similarly to some of the basic commands that are on the basic stamp two uh, and I see. Okay. making it similar because they're aiming at ed- education people that have already been using the some of their stamp. products sure. and now they're trying to bring them over to the propeller with spin and to make it similar they're doing using the objects to do it and to try to simplify it for younger kids sure instead of some of these cryptic keywords like out a and in a and all that they'll just make an object that says pin and, and pin on pin with a number i right. see i see um and it just it's just that's why they're doing it that way right no you know? i mean i i completely understand that i guess yeah. for me though as an adult learner like i like seeing the things step by step you know yeah and you don't want the the training wheels on you just want to learn it right the first time yeah, I guess that's a save you a step in the long run. I guess that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so ah, so that's been my experience. Uh, I mean, spin's been pretty like it's it's. I'm fortunate that I can use simple like LEDs to actually get projects done. Um, mm. but right now, serial communication is tripping me up a little bit, and I think that's just me being. My, there's like a block in my brain when it comes to serial communication. <laughs> so that's okay. Yeah. Well, wait till, wait till you find out about the eight or nine different kinds of serial communication. What? <laughs> there are eight or nine different kinds? Yeah. You're, you're already somewhat familiar with two or three of them just because the propeller uses them. Well, okay, wait. So there's more well, than RS-232? done a little bit of RS-232 and you've done a little bit of IC square, I squared C, right? Right. Oh. And then there's there... SPI, I think, is another one. Mm-hmm. Never heard of it. No. Yeah. Is API one of them? No. No, no. Oh. API is application <laughs> but there, I have no there's idea. Just, there's single wire and double wire, and there's just different... It's mostly all about how the hardware is hooked up and a little bit about how you start and stop the communications Mm -hmm. but ultimately you're just setting the bits off and on in a pattern to send a signal across the wires right you know but uh there are different uh protocols and different schemas before before we let her get too crazy with the questions here i wanted to uh take a minute to thank everybody out there who's been uh beating down parallax's door with positive feedback about the show (laughs) Yes. That's pretty yeah. cool. We appreciate it very, very much. And yeah. it's great for us to hear, too, that people are enjoying the show. So Right. Yeah, we saw that big, long thread going on at the Parallax forums. That was nice. Yes, it was. Thank you. Thank you. So, are you guys ready for my questions? Yeah. That's what we're here for. Excellent. I mean, if we're not doing that, I, I got other stuff I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Movie night. Um. Okay. <laughs> So we go, so we finished flow control, flow control. Now we get memory. And uh, so there's byte, there's word, there's long. Now, when do you determine whether or not you need a byte versus a word versus a long Um, worth of memory? Basically, you need a long unless you don't. There's, there's a, basically the, uh, the, like you said, most of the time you just use longs. Um, there are cases where byte and word make sense to conserve memory or to when you're communicating with something external that has the data arranged in a certain way where you'll want to use byte and words. Okay. Um, let's, uh, let's start from the, from the beginning, shall we, Roy? <laughs> in the beginning, there was a bit. Yeah. Right. Um, and eventually we had uh, 32-bit processors right yeah right parallax propeller is a 32-bit processor which means that at the electrical level inside of the actual chip it knows how to work with 32-bit numbers 
with a single operand, as a single iteration, it can do simple math on them. Uh huh. Yeah. So and, and other operations. Yeah. Yeah. So when it has to work with a word or a byte, it actually still works with a a thirty two bit number oh. in its actual like uh, the the circuit that does the math. It still uses thirty two bits. It just ignores most of them. Oh. Yeah, so it's so, not like you're saving anything necessarily. No, but well, when you're storing things in memory, on the other hand, yeah, then you, if you can pack things into bytes, you can save space that way. But keep in mind that it natively can read out of memory 32 bits. And right. it can natively read in 32 bits. I see. It has to play some trickery to do something like um, read a byte. It has to read an entire long... And then take just the bite. eight of those bits out of it and give you those, right? So right. it has to do extra steps. It can't just directly do it like it can with yeah. longs. So longs are faster. Oh. Well, I think, I think in the case of the propeller, uh, there isn't that much difference in the performance. It's all sort of hidden away mm -hmm. for bytes and words. But it doesn't save you anything to use them on the performance side. It does save you memory, though. I see. Well, I mean, that so, would make sense, though. Right. Okay. On, okay. On, some, on some other microcontrollers, though, using bytes and words might be a little, like, take an extra clock or take a little bit of extra time because of the masking uh, that they have to do. I see. Um, huh. That's but it's, it's something to be aware of. The, like it's, like we said earlier, most of the time you just use longs because you can and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, and and the cases where you want to use byte and word are a little more complicated. Like if you have a big array of data, mm -hmm. say you have a bitmap image you want to put on the screen when we mm -hmm. get to that kind of stuff, then you probably want to use bytes just because it's more compact. It only takes a quarter of the memory so you can hold a larger image. That's the kind of reasoning that you'd want to use a byte instead of a long. Do you yeah. see? You look a little confused. Well, I'm sure we'll un I'll understand it more when we get to Four that bytes point. fit into a long. So if you're using, say, RGB color, it needs a byte for the R, a byte for the G, a uh... byte for the B. You can fit one pixel into three quarters of a long, so three bytes. So mm -hmm. in your memory, you're going to go three bytes, three bytes, three bytes, three bytes. Oh. If you add an alpha channel uh, so that you can long. see through that uses four, then you just use a long per pixel, but you're right. really organizing it into bytes internally. Oh, mm. I see. Organizing things in memory is one of the, the, the core things that you need to understand as a programmer. Gotcha. And this is usually where we... We usually use these in the variable section, right? Right. Okay. So when you're declaring a global variable up in the var section at the top or wherever it happens to be, uh, you would use these byte, word, and long. Mm -hmm. The other pl the other place you can use them is if you're doing assembly, you might have these in the dat section declaring okay. some data space. You can actually use them even in spin. Uh, sometimes they'll uh, do a byte array that's a string that's like some message you want to print. Yeah. You can put it in a dat section and have the whole string in there with the byte in front of it and a label. Mm -hmm. And then you can refer to that when you call like a uh, parallax serial terminal, you can print that string. With gotcha. the... There's uh, so... one other little detail that's good good place to stick it in here. It's It's related. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when you do a local variable on a pub mm -hmm. or a pry for that matter, uh, you know, you list the variable names after a pipe. Yep. Okay. Those automatically are longs. Okay. Yeah, and they can only be longs. Okay. Good to know. Good to Same know. with the parameters that are passed into a function in between the parentheses. If you mm -hmm, have mm -hmm. parameters, those, those are, are always longs, longs also. Gotcha. And it's just really easy to remember that it's a 32-bit processor, so the native variable is the 32-bit, 32 32, and sure. in in this language, a long is 32. So that's good to know. Right. I shall stick with the longs then. Right. Yeah, and unless so you the, need to save space, then go for the bytes. Right. And the next two uh, 
commands here, the fill commands and word. It did not get any love this episode. (laughs) Word. That's okay. So you have bite word and long fill and bite word and long move. Mm -hmm. They're basically the same commands, just doing it in bites versus words versus longs. Right. And so the fill command is just to fill in an array or chunk of memory with the same value over and over again. If okay. you have like 10 longs in memory, you could fill them with long fill in one command. So when would you use long fill? Like what's a... Well, let's see. A nice example might be if you were doing a picture, like we said, uh-huh. and you had uh, a four byte color on there, you know, RGB and A, Yeah. and you wanted to clear the picture to, to set it to a known state. Right. You could do a long fill of zero, zero, you know, and it would just go over the top of it and fill it all up with zeros. And then you know that it's a completely blank, clean slate. Oh. Right. Just say another, a different kind of example. Say you have some code that is talking to uh, multiple different ser- servos, right? So you have like an array of four longs that are the current value that you're outputting to each of the servos. You could use long fill to fill those four values in with a starting value, right? To say, I want them all to equal 1,000 right now or 1,500. Okay. And it will put the 1,500, whatever value you pass in, it will put it into each long. And you you tell it the, the first, the address of the first long and then what value to put in and how many to do. So how do you know the address of the first long? Well, that gets into one of the things we'll get to uh, coming later, but we can... You remember focus. on your cognu command how you throw an at sign instead of the... A stack, In yeah. front of the name of your stack variable? Yeah. Right. That's a pointer. Yeah. When you add the at symbol, it returns the address of it instead of the value of it. So then you could do long fill parentheses at stack, and it would... F- Fill that stack with something? Yeah. If you wanted to clear the stack to all zeros, you could say at stack and then the other parameters of zero and however many, if your stack was 10 long, then you would tell it 10 and it would fill it in with 10 of them. So long fill parentheses at stack well, it's, zero. I'm, well, okay. So, I mean, if when we, if we look at long fill later in the, in the, uh, manual, it'll show us how to write. Oh, yeah. So and and you had can... to write. So you would say at stack yeah. and then comma and then a zero for what value to put in there. Okay. Comma and then how many. So if the stack was 10 long, you put a 10 and then close parentheses. And then could you set like a variable to be? So like if you said long fill at stack comma zero, could zero be pointing to a variable? And then, no, oh. not in this case. Okay. The long fill is is just a single value, and it's just a you know any value that a long can hold, but it's the same value repeated over and over for each long. I see. Okay. The long move, now, are you, you absolutely sure that that can't be a value that's being stored in a long somewhere? Well, it could be a variable that is a single value, but what I'm getting at is. I, I, at least what I was interpreting Addy's question as is having it change as it was filling. No, and, no, no, no. Oh, okay. no, no, no. Not change as it's filling, but say like earlier in the global variables variable oh, section, yeah. you set uh, zero to equal. I don't know. Like well, you would you would twenty six or something. We'll yeah, call it could, filler could, for the uh, the context of the conversation here. The variable right. name is filler. You're setting your filler to some value up in the var block. So then, could you do? Yeah. Well, I I know this is like more detailed than we have been for going through these commands, but could you do a- long fill at stack comma filler? Mm. Hmm. Com- oh. And you could also do comma count, and the third parameter could be a variable that also is telling you how many. But you need to make sure that those variables are defined somewhere and set equal to the value that you want them to be 
before you call long fill. So you can see how this could be very tricky and interesting in in a uh, some sort of an algorithmatic loop. Right. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Now, as yep. far as coming up with a good thing that it's good for, eh, I don't know. You you gonna get the idea? You do yeah. a etch a sketch, a propeller etch a sketch. Most of the time, you use it. You just pass in constants, so you'll. Say at stack, comma zero, comma ten, right? She's gonna be wanting to hook one of her propellers up to a VGA monitor soon. I can wait. Tell. I have a question. Could you do like a like a propeller eight ball? Yep. Yes, you could. That'd be so freaking cool. <laughs> yep. I think I might I might want to do that at some point. Okay. That might be well, we'll we'll get to we'll definitely get to all the things you would need to know to be able to do that. Okay. Excellent. Over the coming shows. Wonderful. All right, so then, so we got fill, and then what's move? So move is similar, except that you give it two addresses. Okay. Um, one of which is the destination where you're going to copy the stuff to, and the other one is the source location where you're going to copy the stuff from. So, so you could... Have, so you, you have two different pieces of memory you can copy from one to the other. When would you want to do that? Boy, there's a lot of different reasons to want to do that. Um, say you have, uh, we'll we'll continue with the you know you have a screen image in memory, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, say you had two copies, you could two buffers, one with a background image that you wanted to put on the background all the time. Uh -huh. You could use long move to copy it from the background buffer over to the screen buffer, and Instead of clearing the screen to a blank color, you'd clear it to an image that you have saved. Oh. Right? One of the tricks they'll use a lot in uh, Simple Graphics Engine is uh, paging frames in and out. So you'll have a copy of it in memory that you work on, and then that gets copied over into the one that's being used to actually display the information. Uh, so you only yeah. ever change the displayed one when you're changing the whole thing at once. Bam. Bam, bam. Right. I see. And you do it at a particular frequency and it updates in lockstep with something else. I see. It's good. Like the 8 bit music or something. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Right, right. I see. Okay. You know, and so, so another like slightly simpler and sometimes more common version of this is to have, uh, you might have a data table in your dat section at the end of your program mm -hmm. that contains a, an array of numbers. Mm -hmm. And then you could have a variable you know, an array up in your var section that's a global variable and you want to initialize it to the values that are in that data table, mm -hmm. you could use long move to do that, right? So you would move, copy the, it's basically going to copy the numbers out of the data table at the end of the program and put them into your var variable that is a global variable. Mm -hmm. And then you could do, you know, runtime changes to those and then restore back from the data table at the end. I see. Right? Yep. It's just a, a, you know, there's there's a lot of much more complicated and interesting things you can do with the move and fill things like we were. Well, it's like of, copy and pasting. Yep. In a sense, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very similar. That works. Okay. Um, and then this look up, look down, biz, what is that? Okay, so look up is basically uh, if you have a list of numbers that could be any values you want, you can tell it to give you the fourth number out of that list of numbers. Okay. Or the fifth number or whatever number you want. And uh, so if you, you know, if you go look at uh, page 138, they'll give you an example there where it's showing look up with index and then a string of seven different numbers. Page 138. Let me... Well, if you just click on the 138 in the PDF, should take you there. Okay. I am here. So look up, right? And you see see down there there's that little bit of code where yeah. it has look up index colon and then a list of numbers there. Yeah. So as it's going through that repeat loop, mm -hmm. that index value is incrementing from one to seven mm -hmm. and picking those numbers out. Oh, so of at, that list. So at one, it's twenty-five. At two, it's three hundred. At three, it's twenty-five hundred. Exactly. 
Oh. And you could put whatever numbers you wanted in there. That'll be handy so you, for some things that uh, Eddie wants to do. So you exactly. could with their heart thing, yeah. Well, I don't know I if mean, I'm gonna go into that complicated with my heart just yet, but like, so that means like that index could go through time, right? Mm-hmm. You could do. You could have it go through time. You could have it just go through like a user input. Like you could have a button that if they push one of seven buttons, yeah, right, it'll figure out which button they pushed and then look up a number and display it or use it to change, you know, the brightness of an LED or how fast it's blinking. All kinds of stuff could huh. be done with that. Interesting. There's, you know, this look up is one of these sort of, uh, you we're just scratching the surface of what you could do with it. Sure. Type of yeah. Yeah. Is yep. What we're talking about here. Yep. But the basic idea is, you're you're uh, you're giving it an a, an array or a list of numbers, and then the parameter at the beginning is picking one of those from one to x. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yep. And then lookup z is just a slight variation of that, in that the value goes from zero to x minus one instead of from one to x. Okay. Right. So. Well, that works. Um, one of the things with programming. Uh, most programming people tend to start Zero. counting with zeros. Mm -hmm. um, the guys that made Spin, Chip and Jeff Martin, uh, Don't Chip like that. Gracie, sorry, they decided to have this uh, alternate version with starting at one just because some people have an easier time. The less programmer type people have an easier time starting counting with one instead of zero. Mm -hmm. Sure. But then they put in the Z version for people like me and Whisker, they prefer to count from zero. Well, we don't prefer and, to count from zero. We understand that it's base 10, which has 10 digits in it. And right. the first one is zero, so we always use that one first <laughs> because we know binary and octal and hexadecimal and base 256 right. and any number of them. We, we go between bases, and right. we actually understand how the numbers really work. Darn so elitist. We, we go from zero <laughs> well, forward. Right. There's a lot of algorithmic reasons why you want to start at zero instead of one also. There's some formulas and stuff that you would use or I just various worry, ways of... I just worry that you guys would end up dividing by zero all the time. No, but we do awesome stuff like uh, doing something to the power of zero. That's fun. That's one. <laughs> That's yeah. an awesome way to find out where you are in a mess of numbers. Oh, yeah. I see. <laughs> <laughs> So then look down mm -hmm. does the exact opposite of look up. So what that one does is you have you still have your list of numbers, mm -hmm. but the value you pass in isn't the index, it's one of those numbers. So in that example you saw there, if you passed in 25, it would return back one because that's the first one in the list. Oh, right? Interesting. And then... Similarly, if you passed in three, it would give you the three, the twenty-five, ten, or whatever, right? And and then of course, similarly, look down Z is the zero-based version of the exact same thing. Interesting. Okay, that works. And besides, mm -hmm. look up Z just looks cooler. It's a much cooler <laughs> looking, you know. Look it's up. Look up. It's, it's got that like that hacker <laughs> end to it. It's got the the the, the cool it's Z. It's got the yeah. ghetto fabulous. Yeah. Look up, Z Dog. <laughs> so right. then these, these then, last two here, yeah. stir size and stir compare, or, or uh, string compare and string size. And what they they're basically just allow you to manipulate and work with strings. Like like I said, if you have that data table at the end where you put in a string of bytes, yeah, and it was like you know, hello world with a return on the end, mm -hmm. then you could use this stir size to tell you how many characters were in that string. Could it be an it, error trap too? Um, like if you compare it and it's not the right size, then you know to throw it out. You could right. use it that way. You could definitely use it that way. And that's actually a good thing to do. Like if you're expecting user input mm -hmm. and they don't type anything, they just hit enter, then you abort, do stir abort. size and the size would be too small so it could like loop back around and go okay you didn't enter anything so i'm going to ask you again to enter the same thing right, right. brilliant um, and then uh stir compare which is this compare string of bytes it basically allows you to have 
uh, your own built-in strings, and then the user types in something, and you can compare what they type to one of your built-in strings, or you could have them enter two strings, and if they type the same thing twice, then you could check that. With it's, like a, it's like a CAPTCHA. Uh, yeah. Kind of. Well, not exactly. It's but, uh, very, very useful is what it is. <laughs> yes. So it, it basically you give it the address of two different strings, and it will tell you if they're equal to each other or not. Gotcha. And and you can use it for a lot of different things. Um, you know, there's any number of examples that we could come up with. The, the simplest one I could think of, like I said, is just if a user types in a string and then types in another one, you could check to see if they were the same. Right. And either either you wanted them to do that and you could say, yes, you did it right, or they're not supposed to do that. And you could say, no, don't do that. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but there's a lot of other more uh, interesting things. Some of the devices, some of the sensors that you might work with, uh, will you'll talk to them in serial, and you could use a string compare to compare what they've fed back to you as a serial string to see if it's what you expected. Right. 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 Yep. Got that, Addy? I think so. All right. <laughs> it makes sense. Well, Today's episode was brought to you by the letters X and B, <laughs> and uh, that's all the time and we the have zero. for this week, <laughs> and uh, well, you can find this show every week at firstspin.tv, and uh, uh, for those listeners out there who uh, have a hard time with the text on the site until we are able to get that a little bit different, uh, you can just hold control and scroll your mouse wheel up and make the text as big as you want and it should make it a lot easier to read for now all right again thank you everybody for all of the awesome feedback this week on the parallax forums we really appreciate that yes we do we'll see all you guys next week uh yeah bye bye see ya <laughs>